Hi, I'm Jake, and welcome to I Hate James Dobson, a podcast born from the intersection of professionalism and religious trauma. Each episode, my friend Brooke and I will break down the psychology and politics of one of the most influential, yet tragically underhated, men of our times. A brief content warning, we are making fun of the reductive and silly beliefs of James Dobson, but we are still talking about evangelical Christianity. As such, there's talk of all of the isms, racism, sexism, homophobia, child abuse, etc. Please have fun, but please take care of yourselves. And now, on to the show. First things to know about James Dobson is that he sucks hard. Just a big old fucking loser who's miserable and makes this fact everyone else's problem. He got famous in the 1970s from his bad parenting advice and then quickly built a Christian nationalist media empire and political lobbying organizations that have a vice grip on our politics today. His bigotry, fragile masculinity, repulsive theology, and endless depths of insecurity have seeped into the foundations of the Republican Party, evangelical culture, and our country and our world, irreparably corrupting everything he touches. Hi, I'm Jake, and I do not like James Dobson very much. I am joined in this pursuit by my amazing co-host, colleague, and collaborator, Brooke. Hi, Brooke. Hi, Jake. (laughs) Brooke, what do you know about James Dobson? Um, I, only what you just said. Amazing. I just learned it. But I have a, I have this desire to be like, what's his name again? Because it's like <laughs> the ultimate power move. It really is. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you know about evangelical culture? Okay. I know about TBN. Is that evangelical culture? <laughs> the Bible Network? Yeah. <laughs> Pat Robertson. We, he comes up in this episode today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the, the woman with the big hair. I knew about her. Well, mm. Tammy Faye mm-hmm. was another one Tammy I knew Faye about. Tammy Faye Baker, yes. Mm-hmm. And I know, uh, yeah, I saw an episode once where they were riding around in gold thrones in the back of a truck. That mm-hmm. was exciting. Amazing. So that's that's how I feel. That's what I know about evangelical culture and Amazing. Christianity in general, which I don't know much about. Perfect. A real outsider perspective. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to me, the way that I was raised, um, Pat Robertson and Tammy Faye Baker are not even real Christians. They're like on the outs- that were That's not evangelical culture. Evangelical culture is like hardcore. That's some like pussy ass bullshit. <laughs> So, two things to know about me going into this project. Firstly, I'm a marriage and family therapist. Uh, Our boy, James Dobson, has a PhD in psychology, specifically child development, uh, and worked as a family counselor. As such, I consider us peers of sorts. We both in family therapy and both have opinions about what makes a healthy family. I have a couple enemies in the field of psychology. Um, Jordan Peterson is absolutely one, but everyone hates on Jordan Peterson appropriately. We don't need another voice dogpiling on him. People aren't shitting on James Dobson enough, and this podcast is here to fix that. Um, The other thing to know about me is that I did grow up as an evangelical Christian. I grew up in the shadow of James Dobson. My family was an evangelical military family, and that is like his target audience. My parents had a plethora of his parenting books. And uh, we all now share the all-too-common scars that come from reading those books. Focus on the family, the putrescent heart of the media empire he created, ruled my life for most of my childhood. I listened to his radio shows, went to churches where he was idolized, and my expectations for my life were heavily shaped by his teaching. And I have some things to say about it. <laughs> I can't wait. For the way that I'm structuring this podcast, um, every episode is going to read another terrible book of his. I've started reading them, and they are... Disgusting. But for today, especially as this is a test for for us, we're just going to talk about James Dobson, who he is, kind of the context of this horrible evil person, and why I hate him so much. (laughs) I'm looking forward to hating him too. A quick little biography. Born in 1936 in Shreveport, Louisiana. He is the worst person to come from that place, which is saying a lot. He's also the birthplace of Chi-Chi Devane. Rest in peace. Oh, R.I.P. Chi-Chi. He comes from three generations of Church of the Nazarene Ministers. Put a pin in that title. Okay. Uh, That's going to come back in a second. He worked as a a sixth grade teacher, a school counselor, a child marriage and family counselor. 
Specifically, he worked on this guy named Paul Papone. Paul Papone, and this is from Wikipedia, was a marriage counselor, eugenicist, and oh. agricultural explorer. <laughs> <laughs> what a resume. <laughs> it's like, eugenicist is just in the middle. It's right there in the middle. <laughs> he was an influential advocate of the compulsory sterilization of mentally ill people and people with mental disabilities. Oh, God. And the father of marriage counseling in the United States. For real? Uh-huh. What? Paul Papone? Uh-huh. I've never heard of this Me person. neither. It's not marriage and family therapy as the feel. It's just like the idea of counseling families. This mm. guy was like the founder of it. He also wrote the foreword to James Dobson's first book, Dare to Discipline, which we'll get to a little bit later. He's also famous for counseling couples away from being in interracial uh, marriages. Okay. Um, just eugenicist all the way down. Wow. And that actually fits really well into Dobson's beliefs. Dobson, for his part, got his PhD in 1967 from the University of California. Brooke, what do you know about the 60s? <laughs> I know a lot about the 60s. I wasn't there. <laughs> but I've heard about it. Yeah, it was a wild time. A pretty crazy time. Yeah. A lot of things moving in the culture. A lot oh, of yeah. uh, explosions. And so Dobson was a big believer in structure and hierarchy and a correct way of doing things and bringing back traditional family values. And so being a family counselor in that time, he had a lot of thoughts about how to restore hierarchy and order and power. What a time to try to do that. Uh Uh-huh. He actually has a pretty decent academic resume. He served as associate clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Southern California for 14 years. And he was on the attending staff of the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles for 17 years, specifically child development and medical genetics. So, like, had, like, actual big boy, like, clinical jobs for a period of time. He was involved in the APA, the American Psychological Association, and he left in 1973 because that was the year that they said homosexuality is not a mental disorder, and he resigned in protest. Okay. Three years later, he quit all of his other academic jobs and went full-time into media broadcasting. He published his first book in 1970, so right around the same time, and it just catapulted him into fame. And that was Dare to Discipline? That was Dare to Discipline. Do his book titles also fit, like, a series of, like, kink books that we could come up with? Oh. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. There's one book called The Strong-Willed Child that's basically just... (laughs) How to Be a Brat Tamer. Oh, yes. This is going to be perfect. <laughs> We're going to talk more later about his uh, ideas about how to spank kids correctly. But really, the way that makes it not abuse is if you give them aftercare. <laughs> Which makes me feel very bad. Yeah, that's not great. So he published this book, Dare to Discipline, in 1970. It was a huge bestseller. The people of the culture really wanted someone giving them structure and order. They just needed a daddy to tell them what to do, mm-hmm. right? And Don't so, we all? Uh, amen. <laughs> we love you, Gary. And so we, when he quit his job at APA and he quit his other jobs a couple years later, he had a big thing to fall back on. He wasn't going broke. He wasn't going homeless. He was really transitioning into something else. He gave classes on parenting issues, the authority of psychology, the authority of a PhD. And then these were taped and then distributed uh, to churches and Christian bookstores. That really is what solidified him as kind of this pop culture figure. I say lectures, I say classes, they're really just sermons. Reading his books especially, it's just like the language and the kind of pace of a evangelical pastor, just with psychological terms kind of peppered in. Mm -hmm. He created a lecture series called Focus on the Family, And later, in 1977, created a media organization and parachurch organization with the same name. I have heard of this. Mm -hmm. Do you know what a parachurch organization is? I did not know this term until I was searching for this. It basically means they support churches. It's a cross-denominational organization, so they work with Southern Baptists and Church of the Nazarene and Methodists and whatever. And it helps them provide them resources that they might not be able to do by themselves. Parenting classes, for instance. Okay. As he grew in popularity, Dobson also printed out and faxed sermon ideas and flyers and speaking points and other resources to churches. So he was really, like, integrated into the foundational organizations of churches. Okay. uh, And really had a big say in what they said and how they said it. Let's talk a little about Focus on the Family. Yes, please. They started off as a radio broadcasting organization. Um, Dobson just really likes to talk, really likes to hear the sound of his own voice, and had a radio show that was incredibly popular. 
It was second only to Rush Limbaugh. Oh. <laughs> and it's still going. It is? It's still going. He is still alive this fucking He day. is? He is. Oh, God. I didn't yeah. know that. He's still okay. going. He's still giving out lectures and sermons and all this bullshit. All right. Forks on Family also, radio is their main thing. They do something called radio theater. That's kind of their, like, if you know them in the secular world, you might have seen some of these. They do productions of, like, Chronicles of Narnia or Les Mis. Well, like an old-timey radio play. Yeah, it's yeah. very that. That, that was okay. their, like, main thing. This is how I first really got to know them. They had a child one called Adventures in Odyssey, which is just child indoctrination. <laughs> and it follows your boy Wit, Mr. Whitaker, as he invents all sorts of contraptions and, and along the way teaches the town the true meaning of Jesus. Okay. And you had to listen to that when you were little? I chose to listen to that when I was little. Oh, I listened Jake. to every episode through like the first 50 albums of it. Every year they just do a whole new series and... It was somewhat serialized, but also somewhat not. And it was ranged from things to very non-offensive things like, don't lie to your parents, hey. to uh, if you have an abortion, you're going to hell. Oh. <laughs> For children. <laughs> oh, baby Jake. I had tapes of it. I would put it in my little tape player. I'm not that old. It's just the technology is pretty old. <laughs> I also had like a little Walkman's portable CD player that I used to listen to them on. I didn't have many friends growing up, but I think this is, puts context into why. But in a lot of the friends that I did uh, have, we would listen to Adventures in Odyssey together. Aww. Also, nowadays, I cannot fall asleep without some sort of media playing in the background. And I think it's because I used to listen to Adventures in Odyssey while I slept. Wow. Do you so, know what I listen to as a side? Yeah. So I also need media when I sleep, and I listen to true crime serial killer um, po- podcasts and shows. Because the music's very soothing. Yeah. Yeah. The voices are typically like down here. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you kind of know how it's all going to end. Yeah. So. And probably healthy for you than Adventures in Odyssey. <laughs> I think probably. <laughs> <laughs> Focus on the Family has a lot of other programs and organizations within it. And Dobson was in charge, like solely in charge of Focus on the Family until 2003. And then he was like president of board of directors until 2010 when he left. Some of the programs include Option Ultrasound, founded in 2004. What is that? What What is that, Jake? What is it? Um, They um, provided ultrasound services to women. Okay. Because, quote, it provided a bonding opportunity between mother and unborn child. They provided crisis pregnancy centers with ultrasounds as a way to convince women not to have abortions. Uh-huh. Whoa. That's just one of their programs. Oh, no. It is not good. Also, crisis pregnancy centers are horrible and evil and don't actually yes. give you health care. They lie pretty openly about what an abortion is yes. and what you will experience with it and the effects of it. And do not go there. Do not go. Absolutely not. Do not go there. And uh, complicated views on adoption as well. Mm-hmm. Very complicated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They have an uh, adoption program. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course they do. Is that the next thing? Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. God. They just help streamline Christian parents through the adoption process to get kids adopted into good Christian homes. Okay. It's less about the kids and more about the indoctrination. Well, um, Okay. I'm supposed to be providing a lot of commentary, but I'm mostly just horrified. Yep. I My mean, mouth is just hanging open and I'm I'm just horrified. Okay. That's the commentary that I feel on the inside. Yeah. They also don't care about kids, really, because they don't want kids to go to same-sex parents, you see, of course. Of course. Because Dobson believes that uh, a kid needs a mom and a dad to thrive. Not just two parents, not just a support system. Very specifically, a mom and a dad. Right. So. When I think modern research has shown that the best parenting duo is a mom and another mom yeah lesbians always do it the best <laughs> yeah but also the thing the reason kids need two parents is because capitalism sucks uh-huh and uh it's impossible to raise a kid not impossible it's incredibly difficult to raise a kid and hold a house and hold down a job and make a decent amount of money unless you're like super rich some people do it and they do it great and god bless them but it is hard yeah it's hard with two parents Focus on the Family was pretty involved with the National Day of Prayer, oh. which has, you know, is on one hand just kind of like a thing we all celebrate in our hearts, but also absolutely a company. A company? A company. Okay. The National Day of Prayer Task Force. <laughs> From 1991 to 2006, it was ran by a woman whose name was Shirley Dobson. Shirley Dobson. 
Why does that sound familiar? Because it's his wife. Oh, right. Uh Uh-huh. And the headquarters of the National Day of Prayer Task Force were in Colorado Springs. Yeah. Specifically, in the Focus on the Family headquarters. Is this a cult? Pretty much. Okay. How do we define cult? Where's the line between religious movement and cult? There's not the cult of personality around Dobson as a person, necessarily. Mm -hmm. Even if people subscribe a lot to his writings, they're not venerating him specifically. Okay. Um, And there's a little bit of, like, freedom and movement within kind of the evangelical sphere. Mm -hmm. But I, I personally do consider the evangelical kind of spectrum to be a super big cult. Mm-hmm. It's very culty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they also, um, Focus on the Family, provided funding for the National Day of Prayer. Okay. The task force. Basically, it just means they enriched themselves. That's what I was going to say. So they provided funding for themselves. Yeah. Okay, good. It's great. Uh-huh. We love corruption. Yeah. What does the task force do? Um, it helps organize the National Day of Prayer. And what is that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> this is like some nonprofits I know. It's like... Raise money for this fundraiser so that we can raise money for the fundraiser. Very that. Okay, good. Very, very that. Okay. Focus on the Family was a big proponent of the Day of Truth. It was started by the Alliance Defending Freedom, which put another pin in that. Okay. It was a counter to the Day of Silence, which was, it still is, a thing that a lot of queer people do, especially in schools, to like, to show what how silenced our voices are and to raise awareness of those who have been victims of homophobia and transphobia and kind of violent... Uh, misogyny broadly Mm -hmm. they didn't really like that no and so they created the day of truth to encourage honest and respectful conversations among students about god's design for sexuality okay because you know what high school students are really good at yeah honest and respectful conversations (laughs) (laughs) about god's design for human sexuality is that what you said yep uh yeah P's and V's. Uh, P's and V's only. Only. Okay. Um, It was uh, taken over by Focus on the Family in 2010, and they renamed it the Day of Dialogue (laughs) to soften the blow a little bit, Mm -hmm. I guess. Um, My personal favorite sub-organization from Focus on the Family is one called Love One Out. This was founded in 1998. I'm sorry. Love One Out. Oh, Love One Out. Okay. (laughs) Instead of Rub One Out? (laughs) I have absolutely called it that before. (laughs) Um, I, so, Love One Out is an ex-gay stop, ministry. Stop saying Love One Out. <laughs> Rub One Out <laughs> is an ex-gay ministry. They advocated for conversion therapy <gasps> and was led by Christians struggling with same-sex attractions, encouraging other Christians to overcome these same-sex attractions. Okay. I just want everyone to know that that's not real. Conversion therapy is not real. No, it's torture. It's just it's torture. It's just torture. It is... Same sex attract. Okay, never mind. Just go on. I, so, my brain is melting out of my ears. The the thing about conversion therapy as kind of a the reasoning behind it. It is not good reasoning, but the reasoning behind it comes from operant conditioning. Basically, like you would train a dog. Mm-hmm. You see gay porn, you get a shock, and eventually your brain would be like, "Gay porn is bad." That doesn't work. Actually, what it does is give people an electro kink. <laughs> um, it's torture. It's horrible. It's evil, and it does not work. You cannot change your sexuality. It was sold to a company called Exodus International in 2009, (laughs) Mm -hmm. which was the largest conversion therapy supporter. And it existed until Exodus International closed in 2013 because they realized that um, actually this is really harmful to a lot of people and we shouldn't exist anymore. Yeah. So good for them. They did one good thing and that was die. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. This is an education. Mm Mm-hmm. This is what I grew up on. I, so the reason that I have a particular disdain for rub one out <laughs> is because when I was coming out, people referred me to them. I watched many like uh, lectures and presentations by ex-gay Christians about how to overcome same-sex attractions and stuff. You mean by gay Christians? Yes. 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 Why is it called love one out? Because... Uh, oh, one. W-O-N. W-O-N. Yes. Uh-oh. Because homosexual desires, that's not really love. Focus on the Family was inducted into the Radio Hall of Fame in 2008. They are huge. They are incredibly influential and incredibly vast. Their reach is so far. Um, Dobson left Focus on the Family in 2010 uh, to found the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, which basically does the same thing. It's a nonprofit that produces his radio program, Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. 
On the program, he speaks about his views, such as attributing mass shootings to, quote, the LGBTQ movement destroying the family. <laughs> what? Yep. We will get into why, kind of the, the underlying beliefs in all of this, because these seem like kind of disparate, like weird anecdotes. Right. But there's a, there is a coherent worldview that ties them all together. Okay. It just is evil and horrible, and this is the outcome of this worldview. So it's not just focused on the family that Dobson does. It's not his only claim to fame. Evangelicals have a huge sway in the Republican Party, and therefore mm. in American politics writ large. Mm -hmm. This started, in the modern sense, because of a guy named Billy Graham. I have heard of Billy Graham. What do you know about Billy Graham? Billy Graham, evangelical speaker, mm -hmm. who everybody loves, mm -hmm. and he's a bad guy. Yep. Okay. But, I mean, that, that's it, basically. And he's alive? No, thankfully, Billy Graham is dead. Okay, great. Rest in piss. <laughs> Rub one out. Yeah. <laughs> Rub one out for Billy Graham. <laughs> just saying. Billy Graham started hosting revival events called Crusades, which I do not oh, like. Oh, yeah, Crusades. Uh-huh. In 1947, when he was 28. Kind of as an anecdote, there's an organization on colleges that used to be called Campus Crusade for Christ. Yes. Based off of this. Okay. Billy Graham... Grew to fame, these events were huge. Celebrities came and, like, devoted their life to Jesus. They were attended by, like, hundreds of thousands of people. He did, like, 400 and some throughout the course of his life. Like, these were big events, very popular. And so he became kind of the de facto leader of the evangelical movement as it was budding. Did you ever go to one? No, thank God. I have heard him talk, though. Um, okay. Only in, like, recorded lectures. At one point... Um, so evangelicalism is a, an interesting thing in the history of Christianity because it's very cross-denominational. Typically within Christianity, there's these like pretty clear schisms. You Not only are you Catholic, and that's different, but like, there's Reformed Catholic, there's traditional Catholic, there's whatever. Evangelicalism just tied together a lot of different sects of Christianity. And Billy Graham kind of led that. And so at the time, people said, how do you define what an evangelical is? It's someone like Billy Graham. Mm. He was like the icon for what an evangelical was. Mm -hmm. He uh, met with President Truman in 1950 and was then a spiritual advisor to every successive president until he died. He was a pastor to 12 presidents in a row. When did he die? 2013. <gasps> yeah. Oh. Obama liked him. What? Mm-hmm. Obama? Yeah. And Clinton? Mm-hmm. What? Well, partly because... I'm getting sad. We haven't had a, a president who's not a Christian, at least self-proclaimed. And also because, we'll get into this in a second, but evangelicals are a huge voting bloc. And yeah. so even if you don't get their votes, you at least have to like appear like you're handing things to them. There's an invitation, and bringing Billy Graham into events with you is like the best way, the easiest way to do that. Wow. He was a super close advisor to Nixon, not just like a spiritual pastor, but like gave his thoughts and advice about how to do war. He advocated <laughs> for the Vietnam War to continue and expand its reach and like its brutality. Okay. Yeah. Bad person. Bad. Congress let him give the first ever religious speech on the steps of the Capitol. Typically the steps of the Capitol are meant to be political and therefore non-religious and right. Congress said, no, go ahead, Billy Graham, you got to do it. This was in a time uh, where anti-communism was huge. We're talking Cold War times. And in the Cold War, it wasn't just anti-communism. It tied together capitalism. It tied together Christianity, masculinity, and like, quote unquote, traditional family values, which the traditional family structure of the nuclear family did not exist prior to 1920. So it's not really traditional, as happens a lot with fascism, which is where this leads. It's this very ahistorical lens around mm -hmm. a mythologized past. Nuclear family is not deeply rooted in our traditions, but they claim it was. Right. And Billy Graham really capitalized on that. In 1964, a fucker named Barry Goldwater ran for president and lost. Huge. Just got fucking destroyed okay. by Lyndon B. Johnson. But this signaled a huge shift in political coalitions. And this is really where we get our modern alignment of what Republican base is and what the Democratic base is. It's basically, you can trace it back to this. Okay. And in this evangelicals became a centerpiece of the Republican Party. Yeah. And it was partly because Billy Graham did not endorse Barry Goldwater that he didn't win. Not solely. 
it would be oversimplistic to say that, but like he didn't, and it was one of his biggest regrets in his career was not endorsing a noted racist, a noted segregationist. Wow. Barry Goldwater invented what's called the Southern Strategy, which is basically just how to dog whistle to racists. You can't say we need to kill all black people. We talk about like tax policy and housing policy. Right. And it affects, the end result is what white supremacists want. Right. But we don't say it as such. There's a level of plausible deniability. That was Barry Goldwater's strategy. Okay. This is horrifying. Mm hmm. Billy Graham created space. Uh, political strength and in that space came Dobson. Mm -hmm. Dobson entered the political scene in a big way in 1979 when he bullied Jimmy Carter into letting him attend a White House conference on families. (laughs) What? Yeah. What happened? He wasn't invited and he was known as like the guy who gave parenting advice Uh and so he encouraged his uh, fan supporters to harass Jimmy Carter until he was invited and then he was. Oh god. And, of course, Jimmy Carter was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Jimmy Carter's actually a really interesting case study because he is a Southern Baptist, and Southern Baptist is, like, the core of evangelicalism, to uh-huh. me, at least. Just, it's called Southern Baptist because it was founded in the South specifically to support slavery. Like, just rotten to the core. But there's a little bit of, like, white supremacy is built into all of America, so, like, everyone's super racist all the time, but also you can be a decent enough person otherwise, and that's kind of where Jimmy Carter was. Mm -hmm. Evangelicalism as, like, a culture really just shifted that. Now evangelical culture is built explicitly on racism. Right. And you can really see that difference in how Jimmy Carter approaches things versus James Dobson. Right. So, he's now on the political scene. I had a feeling that would happen. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Some notable things that Dobson helped found, the Alliance Defending Freedom. So the Alliance Defending Freedom, our good friends we talked about a little bit earlier, they're the ones who founded Rub One Out. Um, (laughs) The Alliance Defending Freedom was founded in 1993, and Dobson was one of the main founders of it, along with some other evangelical people. It was originally an advocacy group. Their primary purposes were twofold. Outlaw abortion and oppose queer rights. Great. Thanks. Good friends. Helpful. Yeah. In 2016, they were designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center, Good. one of the like, leading experts on extremism. Yeah. And uh, the SPLC describes the group mission as, quote, making life as difficult as possible for LGBTQ communities in the United States and internationally. Oh. <laughs> Originally, they just kind of gave money and advice to uh, political organizations, legal organizations. But then they shifted and started doing their own, being their own plaintiffs in political cases. They filed an amicus brief in Lawrence v. Texas, on the side of Texas. Lawrence v. Texas in 2003 was the Supreme Court case that uh, made uh, anti-sodomy laws illegal. So before then, in Texas, you couldn't legally have butt sex. Mm -hmm. And not that anyone, like, enforcement was difficult, but technically you could be arrested for that. The Supreme Court said, no, that's actually unconstitutional. Right. Alliance Defending Freedom said, no, it it absolutely should be legal. We should be able to discriminate against people based on how they have sex and who they have sex with. Right. They started bringing cases directly, though, and 2012, their first big case was one called Burwell v. Hobby Lobby. Oh, yeah. This was the case that said that healthcare plans, employer-based healthcare plans, do not have to cover birth control. Because it was Hobby Lobby as an organization. It was its sincere religious belief that birth control went against the will of God or whatever. Yeah, I remember this. It was the Alliance Defending Freedom was the one who brought that case. Oh, okay. They were also one of the plaintiffs in the both gay wedding cake cases. Yep. Both the Masterpiece case uh, in 2018, which didn't really do anything. And the current one, 303 Creative, one that was just decided last year, that stripped queer people of rights and said, yes, you can legally discriminate against queer people. They brought that case too. They also uh, authored model legislation for bathroom bills in the United States. So they wrote uh, one of the initial bills and then other states copy their bills to make these bathroom bills to say trans people cannot use the correct bathrooms at all. The amount that they care about people's like asses and genitalia. Like what? Why? Sexual repression. Like, it feels like that's such an easy answer, and people say it as a joke, but, like, truly, when you spend so much time saying, I can't have this kind of sex, sex has to do this, and especially when defining things on such gender-based, sex-based terms, that is all you're thinking about, Mm -hmm. and you can't have the kind of sex that you want to have, so either you end up doing it, in the case of 
uh, homophobic pastors who go out and have like higher escorts or just turns into full on hate or a little bit of both. Right. The Mississippi law in the most recent Dobbs case was based on ADF's model legislation. So the Dobbs case was the one that overturned Roe v. Wade. Mm -hmm. It was a Mississippi law that said like super limited abortion. ADF drafted that. Wow. Yeah. This group is terrifying. And powerful. Yeah, very powerful. The other thing that's important to know about the conservative and especially evangelical political side of everything is that it's super insular. It's not just happenstance that these bills get bounced from state to state. It's like a small group of people really moving them around and advocating for them. Right. Of which Amy Coney Barrett was a part. She has deep ties to the Alliance Defending Freedom. Okay. I am really learning a lot, and I'm starting to get very sad. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. It's all bad. It only gets worse. (laughs) I thought this was going to be fun. (laughs) (laughs) They also partnered with The Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro's media organization, to challenge Biden, the Biden administration's vaccine mandates for workplaces. Uh Uh-huh. So, you know, just anti-queer, anti-abortion, anti-vaccine, just like the ADF does and is foundational to wow they're just behind everything pretty much and dobson helped create them yeah what a piece of shit he was one of like five people who founded it i can't believe he's in our field i know well he is no longer a practicing therapist thank god well, thank god but, but yeah i mean i can't believe he came from us Mm-hmm. we'll talk at the end about like how he got to his beliefs and why the field of psychology before 1980 just didn't exist. Don't trust anything written oh, in psychology. Nothing. Don't read a single thing. <laughs> don't look at it. Don't think about it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Another thing that Dobson helped create, because we're not done with this part, oh, was the Family Research Council and the Family Policy Alliance and Family Policy Councils are kind of all kind of mixed together. The Family Research Council, we'll talk about that primarily, was a think tank founded in 1981, which opposes access to pornography, stem cell research, abortion, LGBT rights, and divorce. Divorce. They are against divorce. Just the concept of it. (laughs) Uh, The Family Research Council was a part of Focus on the Family from uh, 1988 to 1992, and it split primarily to keep its tax-exempt status. And the Family Research Council maintains, quote, that homosexual conduct is harmful to the persons who engage in it and to society at large and can never be affirmed, and asserts that it is, quote, by definition unnatural, and is associated with negative physical and psychological health effects. That is not true. It's patently untrue. Like, where... What is this obsession that Christians have with homosexuality? We are going to get to that. Okay, great. This is a... Yeah. I have never read the Bible, Uh and I have never... Like, my... My dad was an Episcopalian a little bit, Mm. and so I went there a couple times. But, like, otherwise I don't know anything. And I just, I have never, like, homosexuals aren't this obsessed with homosexuality. No! Like, what is this? I have a boyfriend and I think about, I'm a (laughs) queer therapist specializing in (laughs) queer issues, and I think about gay shit less than this. (laughs) The Family Research Council submitted another amicus brief for Lawrence v. Texas. So again, getting politically involved. In 2010, the FRC paid $25,000 to congressional lobbyists for Resolution 1064 promotion in Uganda. This was a bill that criminalized homosexuality by punishment of death. Oh my god. And they paid thousands of dollars to Congress to lobby them to support this bill. Wow. It was also listed by a hate group as the SPLC. This one in 2010, so a little bit earlier. It is affiliated with a lobbying pack known as FRC Action, and the executive director from 2013 to 2015 might ring a bell, a lovely gentleman by the name of Josh Jugger. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. I Do not get me started on Josh fucking Duggar. This guy, I wrote a piece about him that I performed, actually. Mm. He, the Duggars in general, mm-hmm. are, it is, it is a... It is psychotic. The whole thing. Mm-hmm. This guy is horrible. That's right. Focus on the family. Mm-hmm. It's all coming back to me now. It's not that big of a world. All of these evil pieces of shit are deeply intertwined with wow. each other. Wow. Yeah. That guy is a monster. Mm-hmm. 
And he was the head of the FRC's PAC. Wow. Yeah, and that's that sexual repression you're talking about because so much going on in that guy's head. Mm hmm. Just so much. Mm hmm. It's horrible. Mm. Dobson's political organizations helped prevent Colorado from certifying same sex marriage in 2006. It was on the ballot. They rallied real hard against it. It did not get approved. Also, can I just say one thing about the Duggars? Yeah, go for it. They go have off. 19 kids. Uh huh. And counting, I hear. And counting. There's some gays in there. There's some gays in there. You can't have 19 people in a room and not have some gays in there. Mm mm. Yeah. I think I know which ones they are, too, but I'm not going to say. And the Duggars would much rather have an active child abuser than a gay child. Right. Really let that sink in. He was abusing other Duggars, and mm-hmm. they still covered him. Mm-hmm. The, like, misogyny, the everything about that is just so, so horrifying. Mm-hmm. Mm. Dobson has been a spiritual advisor to five presidents and has served on eight national committees. Presidents that he has been an advisor to, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Bush 2, Nepotism, Boogaloo, and Trump. (laughs) Well, those are the ones I would have expected. Yeah, Yeah. very much a partisan hack. Very much firmly only Republicans, no Democrats, Democrats are evil, and are of Satan. So Sounds like some of my family members. (laughs) There's a reason. It's Mm -hmm. shit like this. Mm Mm-hmm. That's an overview of Dobson as kind of like a political actor. Let's get to what does he believe? Yeah, what does he believe? Let's talk about this on kind of two different levels, theologically and psychologically. We are therapists. We know psychology. Let's start there. Great. He came to prominence in the 60s, -hmm. and that is when postmodernism as a concept was just starting to trickle its way into psychology. Prior to that, it was a very normative field. Normative being there's one correct way to do things. There's right. a correct way to be healthy. There's a correct way to have a family. That is a universal capital T truth that everyone needs to go to. And typically, that capital T truth was the worldview of straight cis white Christian men. Right. Postmodernism came along and said, well, what do we mean by healthy? How are we defining healthy? And who gets to define healthy? What assumptions are baked into that? And do we actually agree with those assumptions? Mm-hmm. Basically, postmodernism gave language for old straight cis white men to understand that other people have feelings and values. Uh Uh-oh. Not that they necessarily took it, but like... No, because that's threatening. Yes. Mm -hmm. But Dobson hates postmodernism, hates moral relativism, anything that says, maybe maybe what you're saying isn't isn't true, my dude. Yeah, and anything that dethrones him. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He is very big on structure. He believes that in this normative sense, there's a correct hierarchy of the world, correct hierarchy of the family, and we need to help people do that job, do that hierarchy, get close to that. And unsurprisingly, the correct way to have that hierarchy is men are up top, wives are submissive to them, then you have male children under them, and then female children at the bottom. Mm -hmm. That is the correct family structure, and then we see that replicated out through society. CEOs, pastors, etc. There's just a variation on that. Hmm. He's also uh, really informed by behaviorism. This idea of conditioning. Again, just training a dog. But he likes to apply that to people. Which is where you get a lot of his ideas of spanking and hitting kids. If you hit them when they do something bad, they'll learn that that thing is bad. What's it called? In defense of discipline? Uh, Dare to Discipline. Dare to Discipline. My older brother described Dare to Discipline's thesis statement as... Parents get a little child abuse. It's a treat. <laughs> Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Were you spanked? I uh, am autistic, so no. Um, oh. I like to follow rules way too much. I was spanked exactly one time, I think. My older brother was once. Kids, kids don't... You don't know why kids are doing the things that they're doing. Dobson treats kids like little adults. We're talking about psychologically and theologically separate, but they're deeply intertwined for him. He believes that humans are innately sinful. And Mm. so when kids are acting out, mostly it's because they're trying to challenge your authority as the parent. And by spanking, you got to knock them back into submission. you got to knock them back in their place. Right. Because they're actively trying to test you, actively trying to fuck you over. Yeah. Do you want to hear about spanking in my house real quick? Go for it. Um, well, we weren't religious, like I said, but we were from the 80s. Mm. So there was spanking. And I'm just like one or two years older than Jake. And we had, my dad had something called the paddle. 
and it was a balsa wood. It looked like a ping pong paddle that he had made. Made it? Yeah, and it was for spankings. And it was like a little handheld paddle. And he would go to work all day. And then my mom, she would, she can't hear this. She would die if she heard this. But whatever. Sorry, mom. But my mom would like count up our spankings because she wouldn't spank us. My mm. dad would. And then when he would come home from work, we'd be like, Daddy, hi. And then it was like, Brooke gets three. Her brother gets four. And we would like get our spankings. Oh my God. Yeah. And it was wild. And then. We outgrew it when we started writing each other's names on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad realized we weren't taking it seriously anymore, and that, then it was done. But that was the paddle, and oh it was so normal. Oh, my God. Yeah. And, but it's interesting. It, like, it probably still came from this line of yeah. like parenting. Was was the paddle on display at all? Uh, yeah, of course. That is a Dobson like <laughs> technique. <laughs> Great. You keep the instruments of pain accessible so kids are always aware that that is a punishment that you can receive. Ew, Dobson was in my house. Yes. These people, the reason that I hate Dobson and feel so much hate enough to do a fucking podcast about it is that his ideas are not limited to evangelical culture. They are everywhere. They are, yeah. they are baked into now our cultural understandings of parenting and politics and all of these things. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's so systemic. It's just like... It's everywhere, because I wouldn't have known who this was, but there he was. In the 60s, which we'll talk more about when we do a deep dive into Dare to Discipline, people were really starting to question, like, authoritarian parenting. And Dobson was like, no, this is correct, and made the pendulum swing back the other way. Mm. I feel like we should have a little sound effect every time we say Dare to Discipline. (laughs) (laughs) Ow! 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 (laughs) (laughs) Can I have another? The most credit I can give him psychologically, this is me giving him way too much credit and and really applying things to him that he has never stated for himself, is this combination of Adlerian and Freudian psychology. Freudian psychology, this is what you a lot of people classically think of. You think of your subconscious, you think of your defense mechanisms. Id, Id yeah, all of that shit. Mm-hmm. Um, he believes in in that like subconscious stuff. Adlerian psychology is much less well-known in popular culture. And Adler had a lot of, some really good ideas, a lot of really shitty ones. Dobson, what he took from Adler is a sense of inferiority. Everyone is inborn with a sense of inferiority and their job in life is to try to overcome it. Mm. So we have to nurture kids' self-esteem to make sure they don't grow up with that inferiority complex. Dobson blames Lee Harvey Oswald's assassination of JFK (laughs) on the fact that his mom was too overbearing and he developed feelings of inferiority. Wow. Yeah, it is like central to how he believes things. Mm. So it's about structure, it's about authority, and when you have the correct authority, then people are able to feel safe and nurtured and are able to have a sense of self-esteem, which is why it's so that structure, that hierarchy is so important. Mm. But more interestingly, and I think more importantly to understand Dobson, is the theological part. I said he was a member of the Church of the Nazarene. Let's stick that pin out real quick. All right. What do you know about Methodists? <laughs> uh, they They... Like a potluck and they make some good bars? They do love a potluck. (laughs) That they do. To oversimplify way too much theology, Methodists as a like denomination care a lot about acts, doing things. Not necessarily to earn your faith, but like if you are truly saved, if you really have Jesus in your heart, you're gonna do good things. That makes you a good person. Okay. The specific church, the Nazarene, is a sect of Methodism that is informed by what's called the holiness movement. Mm -hmm. Holiness movement believes that there's kind of two types of salvation. The first one that you get when you accept Jesus into your heart. The second one is sanctification. And this is the idea that on earth, in physical form, you can become holy. You can become pure. You can become without sin. Awesome. Dobson believes he's reached that. (laughs) So he is a cult leader. Dobson literally believes that when he's speaking, it is the voice of God. Uh Uh-huh. Uh, right. Okay. We've heard that from lots of people. Yeah. Um, didn't we hear that from David Koresh? We sure did. Didn't we hear that from... Did we hear that from Jim Jones a little bit, maybe? Maybe yeah. not the voice of God, but like... Very much God speaking through him. A messenger. Yeah. Uh-huh. hmm This is a cult. Pretty much. This it's, is a cult leader. It's just diffuse. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so you can be holy on earth by... Okay, got it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to say more. I'm just in so much shock. And so stunned by all of this. As one would believe, when you believe you are the voice of God, you kind of buy your own bullshit in a really heavy way. 
And this, again, just reinforces this normative view of the world. There's a correct way of doing things. There's capital T truth, and I know it. In the context that he was growing up in, in the 60s, when he was coming into prominence, there's so much cultural revolution happening. Questions around sexuality and gender were being questioned. And evangelicalism was basically a response to that. Evangelicalism believes that the correct structure is patriarchal, is white supremacist, and is Christian and nationalist. Christian nationalism believes that America is God's chosen country and mm -hmm. should be inherently a Christian country. Dobson agrees. And in that Christian country, we should have white men leading it. They might not always say it as such. They might do a little bit of distancing to say we love everyone. That is core to their beliefs. Right. Dobson is a eugenicist, unsurprisingly. Unsurprisingly, yeah. Because they believe that this structure is important, the family structure, the nuclear family structure, and to do anything else is destabilizing, that's why you see such a pushback against queer people. Mm. It's because that threatens the gender essentialism that men and women are inherently different and that you need both in your life to be good kids. Mm. Because really, not only is that not true and gay people kind of prove that, it kind of dismantles the entire worldview. Queer people live in this like gray space in between. They add the rainbow to people's lives that would like to see things in black and white. And so once you start questioning, like, well, like, but but gay men can make good parents. Lesbians make great parents. Like, mm -hmm. the, actually, there is not any statistical difference in outcomes for the children's rearing. Then it starts to threaten patriarchy. Right. Right. Yeah. It threatens Dobson directly. It does. Mm -hmm. We can't have abortions because if women are able to control their own reproductive systems, they're not doing what God intended, but also then they're not under the control of men. They're not submitting to their husbands. Yeah, they're not under the umbrella. Mm -hmm. That is why you see just such this visceral lashback against anything perceived as feminine or feminist or queer because it threatens their worldview and really just threatens their authority. Mm -hmm. And Dobson has spent his entire career pushing back against anything that actually helps anyone, really, for the sake of power and control. He has been bought into his own bullshit for so long. He left the field of psychology in 1973 when homosexuality was not part of the DSM anymore, is no longer considered a mental illness, and he has not advanced his beliefs in psychology at all from there. I have read some of his books. I'm continuing to work through some of them. Interestingly, he revised uh, Dare to Discipline a number of times. <laughs> And in the foreword of Dare to Discipline, <laughs> one of the updated versions, he literally says, yeah, all of my advice is good. I'm just telling you more of this advice. I haven't changed my mind on anything, really. No, because there's no progress or evolution or, like, uh, you know, new thought that no. happens with any of this. The, the whole goal is keep everything the same. Yes. Yeah. And keep me in charge. Mm-hmm. So, that is an overview of Dobson. I wow. want to I wanna end... With, with one, little, one little fun anecdote that I'm so excited to share this with you. In 1989, Focus on Family had been created. Dobson is now a political like action person. And he has this big thing against pornography, especially at this time. What? Hates pornography, moral corruption, yeah, yeah. sexual liberation, oh, right. undermines family structure, etc. Right. He found the best, the worst, depends on how you view it, spokesmodel for this view. And a man by the name... Of Ted Bundy. God. <laughs> on January 24th, 1989, Dobson interviewed Ted Bundy on the day before Bundy's execution. In this interview, Bundy blamed his serial killing on the fact that he was exposed to pornography. Oh, right. And Dobson ate that shit up. Oh my god, that's right. Yeah, I mean, let's not forget that Ted Bundy was a serial killer. Mm -hmm. This is not a person that we trust. Rape and murder 30 young women. Yeah. At least that we know of. Yeah. Because he saw some pornography. Mm-hmm. 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 Nope, that, we're here to tell you as licensed therapists. That's, that's not how that works. You can watch porn. It's okay. You can watch porn. You don't have to feel ashamed yeah. unless you have a humiliation kink, and then you should absolutely then be ashamed. enjoy your shame. Yeah. But you're allowed to watch porn. It's not going to kill you. In you fact... Can't. Having grown up in this world that is so anti-queer, anti-pornography, anti any sort of like sexual liberation outside of the, the confines of heterosexual marriage, I have done a lot of research into the effects of porn and, and sexual liberation. And actually, the only time that porn is negatively associated with mental health outcomes is when someone feels bad about it, mm -hmm. when they have shame about it. 
if you generally feel pretty okay about like watching porn, it's not a big issue for you. It doesn't really impact your mental health that much. There's some things, compulsive use of pornography and sure, right. but like watching porn up before bed like twice a week, that's not going to kill you. No. You're going to be fine. Yeah. There's ways, there's ethical porn out there. Like the porn is not inherently good, but also not inherently bad. Right. Yeah. Like sex. Yes. Like you can have sex. And you know what I'm thinking about that I'm really interested in knowing about like the Dobson or even the Christian sort of take on is like this idea of like homosexual sex being unnatural. Mm. Okay. But then like, so then what is the, what is natural sex between a man and a woman? Like how, what are the views of like kink? What are the views of mm. like sexual acts between husband and wife? Does that ever even get discussed or brought up? It's a good question. It it does. It depends on the person that you're talking to, though. Mm-hmm. Um, people like um, Dobson will say sex is great once you're married, and then once you're married, go crazy. <laughs> there, there. Everyone has their own mores and constructs and whatever. But mm-hmm. like, we will get into this more because Dobson has uh, some marriage advice that is horrific but uses quotes from the bible to say that women should make themselves available for sex for their husbands at any point Mm -hmm. basically condoning marital rape i am literally going to burst into flames the last little bit about this ted bundy interview that i just so not only did he eat it up nom 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 (laughs) he recorded it and published it and folks in the family distributed it to churches and made over a million dollars People still, to this day, will watch this interview in churches. Dobson also called on Ted Bundy to be forgiven because he repented. And, and really, the blame needs to be on pornography and not Ted Bundy. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, except for there's billions of people who watch pornography and don't commit serial killings of women. Yeah, surprisingly. Yeah. Don't tell Dobson that, but right. yeah. So when people use this anecdote of like, Pornography causes murder, right? It's like, no, no. Mm -hmm. That was a person named Ted Bundy saying that. Mm -hmm. A person we cannot trust. A known manipulator. Right. Literally. He jumped out a second story window of a courtroom to escape going to jail. Like, this is not a person we can trust. I forgot about that. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many incredible... Ted Bundy moments that just show, oh, this is not a person to be trusted in any way. Like, millions. That was Ted Bundy's whole thing. He was incredibly charming, incredibly persuasive, incredibly manipulative. That's why they cast Zac Efron in the movie, Mm -hmm. right? He wasn't, like, a creepy, weird guy. He was charismatic and all those things, right? Which is, like, hilarious, then, that he just, like, pulled another one over on our buddy uh, Jimmy D here. Jimmy D. I, in preparation for this, and also because I hate myself, I watched the interview. Again, it's on YouTube in a couple different parts. It's not that interesting. Honestly, don't watch it. It's not even like a true crime artifact. It's just bullshit. But it's really interesting knowing who Dobson is and knowing who Bundy is. You just see Bundy doing like a masterclass in manipulation, knowing exactly what to say, what caveats Bundy said. He's not blaming it all on pornography, of course, you see. It's more complicated. And he takes responsibility for his actions. But that's not what Dobson's hearing. Right. That's not what Dobson's point. No. He knows exactly what to tell Dobson, and Dobson just eats that shit up. But also, we have to understand that it's not just Bundy. Like, Dobson's a master manipulator. He's a master, like, persuader. Mm Mm-hmm. He... It doesn't even matter if he knows that what Bundy's saying is full of shit. Mm -hmm. He knows how great this piece of information is going to be for his cause. So I, I kind of do want to watch it in a way because it's just going to be like watching two incredibly persuasive personalities just, just like jerk benefit. each other yeah. off the just, whole time. Just love one out. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and that is where we're going to end it. That is an <laughs> overview of the horrible, evil, writhing maggot known as James Dobson. Brooke, welcome to my personal hell. Thank you for joining me with Thank this. you and fuck you for bringing me into this. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Oh, so fun.
I Hate James Dobson is a labor of love, written, recorded, edited, and produced by me, Jake, with my amazing co-host, Brooke. Special thanks to Drew, Lindsay, DJ, Jack, and Brooks. Our theme music is by Moonbase, and the song is called Trendsetter. Thank you for enjoying our show. <laughs>